Oh, hello. Where are my bros at? Where are my ladies at? Where are my car keys at? I don't know where I put them. Um, uh, I want to thank you all for this amazing conference. This has been a great time, a great experience for me. You know, if, if you had a good time, just clap your hands like three times. You already failed. All right. So, anywho. Uh, no, I want to thank you all. This is so great. I love Steubenville conferences. I love this because I had my own conversion experience when I was um, a teenager coming to a Steubenville conference. I was the... Um, quintessential Catholic nerd. I loved my Catholic faith. My parents raised two great Catholic kids and two out of three ain't bad. So uh, I was really into my faith. I literally bought stickers from, um, uh, what do you call it, Hobby Lobby. And I wrote on the top of my truck, because I'm from Texas, that's how we roll. Uh, I put Catholic boy. That's kind of stupid, but that's what I did. I put Catholic boy on the top of my truck. Um, because I loved and identified completely with my Catholic faith. But here was the problem. This was the problem for me. Um, I had known a lot about God, right? I had a lot of what we call second-order knowledge. I knew about. I knew facts, dates, figures. I knew they were important. I thought that they were important. I, I, I believed them and followed them like they were important. But there was a problem that, that kept me distant from my, from my God, even though externally... I was rocking everything a young kid that, ever, that I thought I was going to be a priest should be doing externally, I was in perfect alignment with, right? I thought I was going to go into seminary in Mexico in high school. I thought I was going to do all this stuff. Um, turns out I didn't do any of it. I'm married. Take that. But uh, that's weird. I shouldn't have said that. But, um, but what ended up happening in my life was uh, I went on a Steubenville conference and I encountered the risen Lord. Right, so uh, I'm married, I got married to a wonderful woman named Shannon, and the thing is this, and um, I, I use this analogy a lot because it really helped me understand what I wasn't getting before. And what I wasn't getting before is this, imagine, now I met my wife, she's older than me, hello, uh, and I met her as a graduate student, she came to Franciscan uh, as a grad student, I was a wee, uh, immature, naive undergrad, and uh, so I met her, and, and now I just imagine, I met her my junior year, fall semester, imagine if it was my sophomore year, spring semester, and I'm walking to my car one day, and some shady guy in a trench coat comes up and opens up his trench coat, not that way, and he pulls out a dossier, and he hands me this dossier, and the dossier is a whole bunch of information collected by the NSA on this woman named Shannon Marie Rothkopf, fun last name, and uh, so I go through and I memorize all these page after page, birthdays, people's names, all that stuff. Imagine I go through and I memorize all that stuff. Now, I would know a lot about Shannon. Now, fast forward a semester, and there I am, and I encounter her. I have an experience of her, right? They can, you can read a piece of paper that says, oh, she's very loving, very kind, very sweet, a very loyal friend, very conscientious, a, a server, someone who loves to serve other people. But then I encounter all of those qualities. And you know, and I know, that that is a fundamentally different experience, right? That's fundamentally different when we encounter someone versus when we just learn about them. And this is the thing. I feel like for a lot of us as Catholics, especially as like cradle Catholics, I'm Irish, right? So you're baptized like 16 seconds after you were born, and I weighed 11 pounds, one ounce. So I was like, when I came out of the womb, I was like, I got this baptism. I'll do it myself. So uh, it was very weird, very awkward, and totally illicit. You can't baptize yourself. Um, so the priest had to rebaptize me as a baby. I'm like, well, bro, is that water warm? It was the worst baptism ever. But anywho, it still worked. Still, still valid. Still valid. Back off. Uh, so what ended up happening, what ended up happening as a Catholic is you're raised and people want to impart to you the truth. So they tell you all this stuff about our faith, about our Lord, about our church, church history, the sacraments. And you have all of this knowledge, this knowledge about but the funny thing is, that's not how it's supposed to go in the Catholic Church. See, I do adult faith formation. And one of the first things I learned that kind of shocked me was the normative form of catechesis and evangelization is like adult catechesis and baptizing adults. That's the normative form. Baptizing of infants and children, all that stuff is kind of like an exception. Even though it's more common, it's not the norm, right? And, and I struggled with what that meant. And what it meant is this. People need to convert and if you don't have this experience of conversion, of turning away from your former life and embracing something new, you're missing out on a significant portion of the Christian journey. 
And so what ended up happening in response to this, for all of us who were baptized as babies, what happened for us? Well, we were never introduced to Jesus Christ. We were never preached Jesus, what we call the kerygma, the basic gospel message. That was never preached to us. Instead, we were just already members of the club, and we were just handed the club manual and said, hey, you better figure out this stuff, you know. And, and then uh, we went to Mass, and, and oftentimes we were never taught how to pray. We were only taught how to repeat. And we know our Hail Marys and our Our Fathers, and we can repeat them, but, but are we really praying them? And we go to, yes, uh, and we go to... Uh, we go to Mass and we're, we're, we're responding to things. Uh, I said the other day, um, or yesterday, that oftentimes when I go to Mass and they say this, right? So if you were in my talk yesterday, I want you to respond. Let us pray. I always feel like you need to say something. Let us pray. Uh, okay. I thought that's what we've been doing this whole time. It's literally the end of Mass. Have we not been praying? Okay, so I said that once and the priest didn't like that. But, uh. So I stopped donating. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> e, that was a joke for the adults. Um, but so what often happens for us is we don't have this, this desperation in our prayer. In fact, for many of us, prayer is just this thing we say as, we, as our head hits the pillow and we fall asleep. Like, oh, Mary, full of grace. Blah, blah, blah. You know, and we're done. And that's the extent of our prayer life. And brothers and sisters, what I want you to know is that we need to bring to you, events like this are so important because we are trying to bring to you that element of that conversion experience. And what I mean by that is this, it is not enough to know about Jesus. There will be no multiple choice tests when you get into heaven. Thank God, because I am miserable at those, right? Because, ooh, what is this, a word problem? Oh, I'm in hell. Um, that's exactly what they do in hell. They just do word problems. Johnny is on a train. <laughs> oh, why did I mortal sin? Don't do that. Go to confession. Um, but when you go to heaven, it's not like St. Peter's going to stop you and be like, whoa, 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 whoa. What does hypostatic union mean? Go. And you got to like define it immediately. Now, now, this is a cool thing. This is a cool thing. Every, when you encounter God, just like when I encountered uh, this woman named Shannon that is now my wife. When you encounter someone in that first order, direct experience, when you become in love, when you enter into a relationship, the thing that is amazing is that second order knowledge isn't stupid. It isn't unimportant. It is absolutely important. But it serves that first order knowledge. So imagine if I didn't know her name. I love you. What's my name? I don't know. Right? That, that's weird. What's my birth date? I don't know. What are my parents' names? No, all these things that are knowledge about, they're important. But here's the good thing about our God, right? So once we encounter God, all of those things that we know about God becomes yet another reason to love him. And that's why we do things at the Steubenville Conference where we talk about the love of God. We talk about mercy and freedom and forgiveness. And that's to bring all of you to this point where you're like, I need to know. This is the God I've learned about, but now I need to encounter him. And you're standing up and you're stretching out your hands towards the Eucharist because you long for more than words. You long for encounter. You long for reality. You long for experience. Subjectively, objectively, you need this in your life. And for me, I encountered that in the middle of Eucharistic adoration. I met the living God. I said, I'm not moving. It wasn't emotional. I didn't break down weeping. I didn't scream. I didn't rip my clothes and be like, ah, I'm hulking out. I didn't do any of that stuff, right? I just stayed with him. I just stayed there in that moment. And I learned what prayer was. I learned that prayer is not just about the recitation of fancy words. But that prayer is primarily, I love it what the catechism says, it's quoting St. Therese of Lisieux, and she says, it, for me, prayer is a surge of the heart, a cry of recognition and of love. And the problem was in my Catholic faith, I knew who God the Father was, I knew about God the Son, Jesus Christ, and all that he did for me, but man, I was missing out on that third person, the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what the Holy Spirit's point was, besides being a dove and hovering over water. That's like the extent of my knowledge. Ah! And you're like, oh, okay. So whenever I sin, that's the sound of doves crying. Good job, Prince. Um, it's a joke for the parents again. Uh, <laughs> I applaud Prince, or whatever his name is. I applaud Symbol. Um, so this is what I want to end with. I want to end this conference 
Because other than mass, I'm the last guy, right? That's pretty nice. Um, I want to end this conference focusing on one very specific thing. You are going to leave this building. If we did this conference and you had an amazing experience here and then you went out there and you left what happened in here in here and you didn't take it out there, then this conference and we as a team have failed you. Why? Because we don't do this to have a good conference. We do the conference so you can have a better life. We do this conference, yes, I will applaud that. <laughs> we do this conference so this becomes a catalyst, right? You're going to go back to your parish and you're not going to have this fancy light bar and a sound team like this and camera crews, very handsome. Uh, you're not going to have any of this stuff, right? You're not going to have the Ike and the worship band sent from heaven itself. You're not going to have this stuff. But what are you going to have? You're going to have Jesus Christ, if you encountered him here, you can take him out there. You can find him out there. If the homilies are boring, it doesn't matter. You still get Jesus, and you still get the gospel. You still get life. And yeah, it would be awesome if every experience, actually it wouldn't be awesome. I would be exhausted if every time I went to adoration, it was like last night. Could you imagine that? I, I was a youth minister, and I had these teens come up to me, and they were like, how come, I went to adoration, um, they were fresh, incoming freshmen, they said, I went to adoration in our chapel yesterday, and it wasn't like at a Steubenville conference. Why? And I was like, oh my God, that would be so exhausting if every time you went, you're like sobbing and you're reaching out for the Eucharist while you're in your like church's daily chapel, you know, and you're sitting there and you're like, let's sing that dry bone song 15 more times, right? <laughs> I love Ezekiel. I love Ezekiel. Um, that's a Bible joke. Uh, so when we encounter all of this stuff, what do we do? What do we leave here with? If you leave here with emotions, guess what? It's going to end in about a week or two weeks tops, and your faith is going to go back to right where it was before you even came. Why bother building it on emotions? You're building your house on sand, and it's going to fail ten times out of ten. Jesus says very clearly in Matthew chapter 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, a wise man builds his house on the rock, because when the winds beat against it, the floodwaters rise up, and the rains fall down, the house will stand because it has a firm foundation. The fool is one who builds his house on sand. But see, the thing is, the fool and the wise man both have the exact same thing happen. The winds beat against it, the floodwaters rise, and the rains fall down. You are going to have suffering, trial, doubt, hesitation. All of this stuff is going to happen in your life. But if you have that firm foundation, you can withstand it. But if your faith is based on the way we made you feel, then it's going to slip through your fingers the moment Life gets rough. But the only thing that we can offer, and we can only offer it, we can only extend to you the invitation, you yourselves must come and receive it, is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. St. Paul calls it life in the Spirit. He says it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that we put to death the deeds of the flesh. That doesn't mean St. Paul is saying, I hate the body, the body is evil, the body is wicked. What he's saying is oftentimes our bodies want pleasure regardless of whether it's good for us. Even if it destroys the body, the body wants pleasure, right? But what he's saying is if you understand the point and the purpose of everything, which is God's Holy Spirit comes into your life and changes your priorities, then what happens is the domination of the flesh and the things of this world get reprioritized. That yes, it's important to have a job and make money, but it's not the most important. Yes, it's important to have friends, but you don't let having of friends dominate your moral choices. And so what ends up happening is the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you are able to live the Christian life, not on your own, because the great secret of Christianity is you cannot do it on your own. You cannot live the Christian life on your own. We can applaud that. You can't. You can't. And this is the source of what, I, what, what like a fancy adults call Catholic guilt, right? Is they know what they should do and they're really, really trying hard to do it in order to become worthy of God's love. That is a lie written. That's called a Pelagian heresy. That is condemned by the Catholic Church. Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, these are fun words. If you figure out how to spell that, you can get a lot of points on Scrabble. Um, but Pelagian heresy basically says, no, 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 Jesus didn't come to save us from our sins. He just came to be a good example of how to live a virtuous life that we can all do. And St. Augustine's, St. Augustine, Pelagius, heretic, St. Augustine, right? So St. Augustine wins. Um, Hashtag Augustine wins. Um, and so what, what ends up happening, what ends up happening is St. Augustine ends up defining for us, really, really making clear this desperate necessity of grace. Desperate necessity of grace. 
you can't do it on your own because your will is part of the problem. Our intellects have been darkened, our wills weakened, our emotions erratic, our bodies seek after pleasure, our emotions satisfaction. So where do we turn? We turn to the person that Jesus Christ said, I have to leave in order to send the advocate for you. You can't do this on your own. So I'm going to do it through you, by the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a, is a wild goose, man. The Holy Spirit is crazy. The Holy Spirit, if you start listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, if you ever get those stirrings in your conscience that go beyond just moral right and wrong, like your conscience is like the natural law saying, do this, don't do that, right? But there will be another point in your life where you'll see someone and you'll, you'll feel this thing what we call a prompting. And it will be like, go and talk to that person. And you'll be like, I don't know this person. Go and talk to that. And you feel weird. And then you walk up to that person and you're like, hi, my name is Michael. I'm s- God told me to talk to you. Right? Now, the funniest thing is you could get two very distinct reactions to that. The first one's, oh, my gosh, how did you know? Right? The other one is, oh, my gosh, you crazy. I'm running. Right? So, and I've had all three of those reactions. Wait, what? Um. And so what ends up happening, right, is the Holy Spirit begins to move in your life. And see, when we, what we do is, like, we want Jesus to fix the really big, bad, broken things, the, the potentially embarrassing things, the sins in our lives that we gravitate to that our society doesn't really like a lot or maybe our families don't like a lot. So we ask God, God, heal me. God, fix this thing. And then Jesus enters with the power of the Holy Spirit, enters into your heart and says, all right, I'm going to fix this thing. And he starts working and repairs this part. And then he looks around at the, the house of your heart and he's like, all right, this is also what we're going to do. We're going to knock out this wall. We're going to put in some French doors, it's going to be awesome, let in a lot more light, we're going to put a skylight over here, we're going to, be, and you're like, whoa, 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 no, you fixed the thing, that was great, I'm very happy, but now you can go. And Jesus is like, oh, here's the thing, man, you invited me in, and when I come in, I'm going to not stop remodeling this place until it looks like my heart. And what we need, <laughs> your cheering is cutting into my talk time. Uh, <laughs> So what we need to do is we need to allow, we need to allow the most dangerous prayer, one of the most dangerous prayers that we can pray to take priority in our lives. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Just do what you want in my life. Come Holy Spirit. Change my priorities. Come Holy Spirit. Show me one person that I need to talk to today. Come Holy Spirit. You just like, like rip this desire out. In my life, I I shared in the men's session that when I was really, 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 really young, six years old, I was exposed to pornography through an older brother's older friend's skeezy dad, right? And that affected my life. And part of the healing process, people come up to me and they say, well, what did you do? And I said, well, I prayed the rosary a lot. And they said, well, what else did you do? I pray the rosary all the time. What else did you do? And I said, you know what I do is I'll get down on my knees and I'll pray and I'll say, I'll say, Lord Jesus, send me your Holy Spirit and fulfill in me what my, what I'm really desiring, what I really want at this moment instead of pornography. That pornography is a fake version of what I really long for. And this is how we need to focus everything. You cannot do this alone, but Christ does not leave you alone when you walk out those doors. He has gifted you with his Holy Spirit. You are not alone. You are not alone in this, that God is within you, strengthening you, changing you, challenging you to live not just a morally better life, but to live an exponentially full life. And you can only live it if you give it away for others.